Good morning, everyone. I'm Jeannie Aguinaldo. I'm your moderator for this workshop. Um, hopefully, uh, welcome to the first round of workshops for our final day of the conference. Um, hopefully, you've enjoyed the conference so far and had a great morning. We had a very powerful keynote speaker with Dr. Rama, and hopefully, enjoyed uh, the Zumba break as well. Uh, this is medication assistant treatment for opioid use disorder. And um, just a few quick reminders. Um, don't forget to fill out the evaluation at the end of the day. Um, this session is being recorded. All the sessions are being recorded and will be made available on the website um, in a few days. Um, and also the slides will be made available as well after the conference. And so I'm very excited to um, welcome our speaker for today. We have Dr. Amy Moulin. She, she's the co-principal investigator for the California Bridge Program. Um, she will be doing the presentation. Uh, she uh, is happy to make it as interactive as possible. So if you do have questions along the way, um, go ahead and feel free to put that in the Q&A and, um, and she'll, uh, I'll hand them over to her and she can answer them as, as she goes. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm really excited to be here. So thank you all for joining us. And just to let you know, so I'm an emergency physician. I work at the University of California at Davis Medical Center here in Sacramento. And one of the things about being an emergency physician is I like being interrupted. That's just sort of part of the way that I work. So please stop, ask questions, put them in the chat, um, put them in the Q&A and Jeannie will feel free to interrupt me at any moment um, because I'd, I'm really excited about this topic and I wanna make sure that I get to all of your questions. Um, so quickly, here's what we're gonna talk about. We are gonna talk about the medical model of addiction. Um, we're gonna talk about addiction as a medical disease. I think a lot of us and our kind of thought of this as a disease of choice, but really to understand what happens and what happens in the brain when we have patients who are, or individuals who are suffering from addiction. We're gonna talk specifically about adolescents and kind of understand why they're at such high risk. Um, a little disclosure here though, we're gonna talk about some receptors and some biochemistry. I'm gonna try and make it fun, but please answer questions. So just, just lay that out there that this is gonna happen. Then we're gonna focus on something that is really near and dear to my heart and that is treatments. And that I really want you to walk away from this talk with two things. One is an understanding of treatment options and how important this is to offer treatment to everyone. And that includes our adolescent population. And then we're gonna talk a little bit about how the medications work. And then finally, I'm gonna put in a plug for naloxone. Um, and we're gonna talk about that. And I know one of the other speakers went through this and we're gonna kind of reinforce that and talk about how important it is and how you can save a life. All right. So this is why I'm here talking to you, because what we know is that substance use disorders begin in adolescence, but treatment does not begin until adulthood. And so we all know, and those of us in the, in the treatment community know that we are missing people. We know from the folks that we are treating as adults that they started as an adolescent. And so we know that there are years where we are missing people, where they are, the severity of their disease is increasing. And so we're not capturing them until later in adulthood. And so what I'm hoping that you guys can help me do is to start to find those adolescents and so that we can start to offer treatment and engage people early so that we can stop some of the consequences that occur from substance use disorders. Okay, so this is some data. This is a study, basically a survey of, of admissions to a substance use treatment program. And they asked people when they were being admitted to a treatment program, when did they start using? And so this is the data that lets us know, wow, we are missing people. Because if you look at this, you can see that most people are starting in adolescence, the majority at between 15 and 17 but a lot of individuals who go on to develop substance use disorder started as young as 11. 
And that's hard for us to hear. And it's hard for us to think about these young adolescents as engaging in use, but we know that they are, and we know that these has long-term consequences. So I just bring this up just to, just to kind of reinforce what we already know is that there are adolescents out there who need our help and we really want to try and reach them. Um, everybody talks about, you know, the missing adolescents, like where are they? Because we know that they're out there. And if we could just reach them earlier, we could prevent some of these consequences. So again, this is just to recognize like the age of first use is around 17 and the age of initiation of treatment is not till 26. So what this tells us is there is almost a decade between when someone first starts using and when we finally get around to engaging that person in treatment. So I call this sort of that lost decade. And what I'd like to do, and I'm hoping we can all partner and help to bring that number down. And so that that age of first treatment will start to go back down and we will be able to engage individuals earlier in a conversation around treatment. And so that we can prevent some of those longer term consequences and not have that lost decade that we're seeing out there. And just another statistic to kind of reinforce why we're talking about this is only 10% of individuals between the ages of 12 and 17 who would qualify for treatment for substance use disorder. So these are these are people between 12 and 17 adolescents who would meet the criteria for substance use treatment are actually receiving services. So I know we can do better. Um, I know that we can, we can do better than 10%. I know that we probably won't get to 100, but, but we can do better. There's a lot of room for improvement here. Okay, this is something that I always talk about. Um, addiction is not a moral failing. This is a chronic disease that requires medical treatment. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about why, and it's gonna get into some stuff that you don't might like, some biochemistry, some receptors. It's gonna be a little bit painful, but we're gonna work through it. And I think it is important because society really tells us that addiction is a behavioral problem. And that often there's an underlying judgment around when people are suffering from addiction, we judge them. We say, well, that's your fault. That's because, you know, this is because of your parents. That's because of how you were raised. That's because you're a bad person. And that's just not true. And that this is really someone who needs our help and that we can help. And that when people are in treatment, they actually have really good outcomes. Um, and that's the other message that I hope you walk away from here is that treatment works. And so, people and adolescents with substance use disorders are not doomed and that they can very much be treated and go along to have very functional, healthy lives. All right, so we're gonna talk about why, and this is the medical model of addiction. This is what happens in your brain that causes addiction and why people behave the way that they, they do. So, this is something that we should all be a little familiar with. This is the teenage brain. Those of you who have teenagers or work with teenagers, this should be very familiar to you. And why I wanna bring this up is so here you have the teenage brain. I love the, the chore particle back here in the occipital lobe. Um, and what you will often see is there's this, the frontal lobe, which they call the love lobe. And the frontal lobe, is essentially the part of the brain that tells you not to do something. So you have here the slamming, punching reflex. You have the Facebook and cell phone addiction. Um, these are the parts of the brain that say, yes, I want to play on my cell phone. Yes, I want to do this. This is sort of that um, response part of the brain that says, I want to do this. I see a chocolate cake. I want to shove it in my face and eat all of it. I want to spend my whole day on the cell phone. The frontal lobe is the part of the brain that says, you know, shoving an entire cake in your face is really not socially acceptable. We really shouldn't do that. The frontal lobe is the brakes. The frontal lobe is the part that says, hey, that's not something we should do. Um, frontal lobe development finishes around 26. 
So if you think back and you think to your own life or how the adolescents and young adults make decisions, you can see this, right? You can see that we're developmentally not able to make those really good decisions until 26. That's when the frontal lobe is fully developed and can really pull those emergency brakes and say, you know, that's not a good idea. That's not what we do as a society. I'm gonna look bad. That's not, we're gonna stop. We're not gonna make that decision. And part of that mismatch in development is why adolescents and young adults have, are so vulnerable to substance use. Okay, so this is, this is, the, um, this is the actual version here. And remember back here, there's the addiction nodule here. This is actually real. This is called the nucleus accumbens. And this is the part of the brain that, that this nucleus accumbens here that really is responsible for addiction. And what you can see here is this is the pathway. So that frontal lobe, which is the, the love cortex, it, it provides feedback. So the nucleus accumbens says, Hey, I want it. I want to do this. I want to do this. This is, this will make me happy. Having chocolate will make me happy. Um, and the frontal lobe says, you know, we can't do that. That's, that's not what we're supposed to do. So this is the way that those feedback pathways work. I'm going to pause here for questions. Does this make sense? Let me know if anything comes up in the chat. Okay. So this is what is responsible for the Superman complex. That nucleus accumbens, which is that deep midbrain part, that part that says, that responds to dopamine, that says chocolate makes me happy, heroin makes me happy, that is fully developed by age of 14. So it is very powerful at the age of 14, the brain is really responsive to dopamine, to those positive receptors, to saying like, chocolate is good. These are the things that I want that those signals are most powerful by the age of 14 because that is fully developed. But then remember the brakes, the frontal lobe does not develop until 26. So what you get is the Superman complex and you see that adolescent young adult behavior, which tends to be impulsive and pleasure driven. That has the basis into how our brains actually develop. It's that mismatch between the nucleus accumbens development and the frontal lobe development. And we see this, we, this should all ring true for those of us who work with adolescents and young adults. And this is again, this is what I was talking about is you can kind of see age related responses. And this is the response. So this is, this is part of the stuff that's hard. So this is a study here that looks at how people respond to pleasurable to that response reward pathway in the brain. So they have a pleasurable response, what happens in the brain. And you can see as you develop, um, there is a differential in how they respond. So you can see what happens is the nucleus accumbens as it develops has that higher response. And then as you become adult, the frontal lobe takes over. And so that's what you see as you move through, you can see that gray line is the adult, they have that kind of attenuated response because the frontal lobe is taken over and the adolescents have that really big response over there on the right hand side. You can see they have that, that large reward response in the brain. Okay, um, so basically what we see is that there's this, the brain is actually sensitized and adolescents become very sensitized to that positive reward. And so when the adolescent brain is confronted with that positive reward of a substance, heroin, opiates, marijuana, or anything that causes dopamine release in the brain, their brain is gonna tag that, like that, seek that again, and they don't fully have the development of the frontal lobe emergency break. So they become extra sensitive to the effects of dopamine and substance use. So I really wanna get into is treatment. So now we start to understand, hey, this is a medical problem. This is not someone making bad decisions, but this is a brain that is sensitized to make bad decisions and substances are gonna extra respond to that brain. And so that's what's gonna happen when we see addiction start to develop in our young adolescent population. 
And really let's talk about what we can do about it, treatment options. And generally, what is our plan? When we are confronted with someone that we're concerned about substance use, what do we tend to do? And this is, tends to be our plan. It's just, we really hope that it doesn't happen. We hope for the best and we hope that, we, that this doesn't progress. Um, and I wanna move past, this is our plan to really talk about like, what are the treatment options? so that we can all be a part of moving that 10% of adolescents who are receiving treatment up to 25, 50, 60, 70% of adolescents who need treatment are offered treatment. And that 10 year gap between initiation and use can start to shorten. So what treatment options are there? And I want you to know about these just so that you feel facile and can explain to parents and families what are their real treatment options and to understand, hey, this actually works. And so that you can kind of in encourage people to get into treatment from a way of knowing like this, this works and this is something that can really save a life and change their trajectory. So most commonly we see cognitive behavioral therapy. And basically what this does is to remember we have that reward pathway in the brain where the nucleus accumbens gets that dopamine response and says, hey, I want more of that. Cognitive behavioral therapy starts to try and link um, different coping mechanisms so that it teaches the brain to have alternative pathways. When the brain says, hey, I want that chocolate cake, we teach the brain to say, you know what, maybe I'm gonna have one slice or I'm gonna have an alternate coping mechanism. I'm gonna go for a walk when I feel the need for this this thing that I've used, we kind of develop some alternate pathways. Um, cognitive behavioral therapy has really shown to be effective for individuals with substance use disorders. Um, it has shown to be effective for adolescents and young adults. It is frequently employed. It does show less efficacy for those with opioid use disorder than those with alcohol and marijuana. Um, and so this is important because for individuals, particularly adolescents with opioid use disorder, we do want to consider that there are multiple options and multimodal. Contingency management. Um, this is a really interesting technique that has shown a lot of efficacy, particularly in our adolescent population. So remember, adolescents are really sensitive to that response reward pathway in the brain because of the way that their brain has developed that Superman complex. They really respond to dopamine. Um, and so what contingency management does is when it rewards positive behavior, but not consistently. What the human brain really likes is a random reward. So think about Las Vegas. People like to gamble because it's that random reward process. So our brain is really um, responsive to a reward that is random. We really like that. We don't know if we're gonna get something. And then if we are rewarded with something that is better than we expected, our brain really likes that. So it leverages that and we link positive behaviors. So if someone, comes to treatment, someone is using less, someone is engaging in school, engaging in behaviors that we like them to, we want them to do more of, we reward them. Um, this can be prizes, cash, gift cards, but it is that random reward that our brain really likes. And so that will then cause dopamine release in association with what we want that person to do. It's a really powerful technique, particularly in treating adolescents with substance use disorders. And then the other piece that I'm a lot a part of is medications. And we're going to talk about medication treatment and how the different medications work. And I'm going to pause for just a moment to see if anyone has any questions about what we've talked about so far, because I know I've kind of gone through a lot. Yes, I think there is, let me switch over a question. What would be some appropriate random rewards for youth in treatment? Yes, yeah, so the random reward um, can be anything from a gift card. Um, I've seen, you know, things that adolescents like. So you could even do 
financial, like gift cards to Amazon, iTunes, um, but you can also do like specific awards, like a, you know, get out of homework day or any kind of prize that they would like, but is potentially unexpected. So it's something that, that they're gonna want, but they maybe aren't expecting. Um, the brain really likes that. People have done this for um, young adults with just cash. Um, you know, they'll spin a wheel and get between 50 and 55 and $50. Um, but it's that kind of random reward. And if it feels like you're encouraging gambling, you are. Contingency management is leveraging the way the brain responds to gambling. Um, but we're using that to link it to positive behavior so that, that the brain will then tag, hey, I went to my counseling appointment, I took my medications, and I got a positive response. And that's the way that we use that. Hopefully that makes sense and answers that question. Anything else? And that's all for now. Yeah, that's it for now. Okay. Um, so then we're going to dig into medications. This is my program. So a lot of the problem that I think we see with adolescents and young adults is it's hard to access treatment and it's hard to figure out where to find treatment. And so this is the program that I'm involved with, which is really integrating treatment for substance use disorders into regular medical care. Um, and we have been working with 52 hospitals across California to provide access to treatment. Oops. Sorry about that. Hopefully we can get back to the presentation. Um, to provide access to treatment so that my goal is by sometime next year, if you feel like you just want to send someone to the hospital, if you find that there's someone that you're encountering who's in crisis and you want to be able to say, hey, go to the hospital, go to the ER, that we will be available to get folks into treatment. Because I think this is an emergency, that it is a life-threatening emergency and we really need to be able to offer resources at the moment of crisis. So here are how medications work. Um, so what this, what MAT or MOUD, you will hear both of these used. MAT is considered medications for addiction treatment and MOOD is medications for opiate use disorder. These are sort of interchangeable. Um, They're both sort of interchangeable. Um, the specific one is medications for opiate use disorder are, are these three medications that are FDA approved. Methadone is the one that you've heard the most about. That is a full agonist, which is a replacement therapy, which means it acts similarly to opiates on, on the brain and in the body. Buprenorphine or Suboxone, which is the one that I use most frequently, is a partial agonist, which means it has some of the effects of a full agonist like heroin or morphine, but it also has some of the effects of blocking those effects, which is similar to Narcan or Naltrexone, which is an antagonist. So the way that Narcan works is it, is it binds those same receptors but it blocks any action of a full agonist. So I'm gonna kind of dig into what that means a little bit and what is the difference between these medications because I think sometimes they get all tied up into one and people think only of methadone when they think of treatment. And in a lot of ways, um, there's some stigma against methadone treatment, particularly for adolescents. And I wanna kind of work through what the different options are and how they work so that we can kind of all be on the same page. So this is our opioid receptor in the brain. Um, this is what's happening and causing that effect in our brain. And the full agonist, basically you can see that opioid molecule binding to its receptor and it fully activates it. It causes euphoria, it causes respiratory depression, decreased breathing, all the things that we normally think of when we think of opioid medications. That is a, and it causes the full dopamine response. So our brain gets that full, um, wash of dopamine, all those positive feelings, it tags the brain and the nucleus accumbens is really happy because it's full of dopamine and it thinks that was a great experience and wants to do it again. That's what happens with a full agonist. A full antagonist, this is Narcan, will take that receptor, kick everything else off, 
block anything from binding and it basically works as an antidote. So it goes to the receptor, it gets rid of the opioid medication and it blocks it, but it does not activate it. So it basically blocks any of the effects of dopamine. What will happen is it will cause instant withdrawal because it takes that opioid receptor, that opioid molecule off its receptor. This is the way that Narcan works. Essentially, when someone has overdosed and we give them Narcan, it pulls all of the opioid medications off the receptors and reverses all of those effects. So that is how a medication like Narcan or naltrexone work. Partial agonoids, this is buprenorphine or suboxone. It does a little bit of both. Um, it's kind of a, a very special medication. It really likes the receptor, so it binds very tightly. So it'll find that receptor, it'll sit on it, and it'll say, my receptor, and it won't let anything else bind. But it only partially activates the receptor. So you'll see a little tiny bit of dopamine response, but you will not see a full, a full opioid response like you would with methadone or heroin. One of the magical things about buprenorphine is that it has a high affinity for its receptor. And what that means is they re it, really likes its, it really likes to be there. So if I've given buprenorphine to a patient, buprenorphine finds all the mu receptors, binds very tightly, sits on those receptors, and refuses to get off. And so if I've given enough buprenorphine to someone, and that person then leaves, injects heroin, the heroin molecules will be floating around and not find any receptors because buprenorphine will not leave the receptor. It will bind really tightly, it'll hunker down, and it'll say, not on my receptor. Um, and so that's why we see this really therapeutic effect of buprenorphine where it prevents withdrawal. Um, it provides that partial dopamine so the nucleus accumbens is happy. It's not telling the brain that it needs to go out there and find more opioids and it allows the brain to recover. And so this is a very, a really great medication in terms of providing treatment, particularly for someone whose brain is used to that dopamine response. It will help the brain to recover and it will allow that frontal lobe to start to make better decisions. Um, and so basically what we see is less withdrawal and less, um, you'll see that they have less withdrawal and less cravings. Buprenorphine or Suboxone has been used to treat both adults and adolescents with a lot of success. We have seen decreased use and longer retention in treatment. So particularly when it's combined in conjunction with some of those other treatments like cognitive behavioral therapy or contingency management, when we add buprenorphine, that medical treatment that helps the brain to recover, helps the brain to stop the craving, it helps the nucleus accumbens to stop craving that dopamine because it's partially blocked, we see that adolescents are better able to engage in the other modalities like cognitive behavioral therapy. So we've kind of treated the addiction at the brain chemistry level. But we're doing it without the full agonist, the full euphoria, and a lot of some of the other problems that have gone along with full agonist treatment. Um, the other benefits from buprenorphine, unlike a methadone clinic, is that it can be prescribed by a primary care provider. It can be used as an outpatient. There's lower abuse potential, and it doesn't have the same effects on the brain as a full agonist. This is particularly useful. So a lot of methadone treatment, people have to show up every day to receive methadone treatment, which can really inhibit sort of the normal functioning of our day-to-day -day life versus buprenorphine treatment. People can go about their daily business because it can be prescribed and just a regular medication that someone will take on a daily basis. I'm gonna pause here for questions and see if there's anything that's been put in the chat because this is really kind of important to kind of understand what the differences are. Nothing at the moment. Okay. We will just keep blazing. You guys are amazing and hopefully um, are not just come so lost you can't answer any questions. Feel free to stop me. Okay. So here's the thing, like what can you do? 
you can say, Amy, I hear all this information, but how does this affect me? And how does this affect the people that I am encountering? Um, so what can you do today, walking away from here to kind of change some lives? Um, one is to kind of understand like, hey, there is a role. There's this role for screening, brief intervention and referral to treatment um, that can be initiated. So when you find someone who you are concerned about that screening process and referring to treatment has shown efficacy, particularly for adolescents in a variety of settings, including several school-based health pilots um, where they have implemented this process of screening. I know that one of the other speakers, so some of you maybe have already had training on naloxone. I'm going to walk through briefly how you kind of just make you understand like this is actually really easy medication to use. Also, there is a naloxone distribution program through the state of California that is pretty broad. So anyone can apply. Um, the state will give free naloxone to many organizations, libraries can dispense naloxone. So one of the things you can consider doing is applying for some of the free naloxone through the state of California. Um, it is safe, it is easy to use, it is over the, the counter without a prescription. And again, you can get free naloxone from the state that you can use and dispense. So, Let's start with how you would use naloxone. How would you know when someone is overdosing? Like, what does an overdose look like? Um, and here are the three signs. One is we look at pupils. So we see very small pinpoint pupils. You will see slow, shallow breathing. So basically one of the big side effects of opioid medication is it's a respiratory depression. So you see very slow, very shallow breathing. And then it's also a CNS or a central nervous system, a brain depressant. So someone becomes less responsive and unconscious. So what do you do if you see one of these three signs? And you can see my lovely pictures here. Um, and this is available too, so I could send this out. First, we try and wake someone up. If they don't wake up, we call 911. Second is we take out our naloxone. And this is functionally just a quick nasal spray. Um, and it's just a nasal atomizer. So you open the package and it has that little button at the bottom. You put it in someone's nose and push the button at the bottom with your thumb, like you can see, and essentially it will deliver a spray. If you have been trained in CPR and the person is not breathing, you would go ahead and initiate CPR. Naloxone should take effect in about three minutes. If they don't wake up, you can go ahead and give a second dose in the second nostril with your naloxone spray. Um, two sprays should do the trick. So if it's a overdose, then your single kit of naloxone could, should work. It lasts for about 30 to 90 minutes. Um, it's pretty easy to do. It's really just a matter of using the nasal spray. So those of you who've been trained to use EpiPens. They're a lot scarier. This is really super easy medication. Um, the other benefit of naloxone is that it's really very safe. Um, if someone is not using opioid medication, it should almost have no effect. So if you are not using any opioids, naloxone has nothing to displace and you, your, your um, person you give naloxone to will have no effects. They pretty much won't notice. So it's a pretty safe medication. It is really specific because remember, this is that antagonist medication that will act on that opioid mu receptor. It will act as an antidote and kick off all of the opioid receptors. So it's pretty specific. It pretty much acts only at that mu receptor and we can use it to reverse a overdose. So hopefully this is something that you can all consider doing and this 
will kind of decrease some of your um, fear around using this medication. It's really pretty safe. And this is something that I also really kind of want us to walk away with. And so this is why I'm saying this again, is that addiction is not a moral failing. It's a chronic disease. And so this is, um, this is a disease that we can treat. And so when you see someone who is potentially using, suffering from a substance use disorder, and you'll see some of those behaviors that are associated with the substance use disorder, we frequently see that, remember the brain really wants to, to seek out substance use, particularly in adolescence, because they don't have that full frontal lobe development, which teaches them to say no. You will see behaviors that are associated. Um, being manipulative, lying, some of these behaviors that are symptoms of a substance use disorder. And so a lot of times those behaviors that we associate as negative are symptoms of a severe use disorder. And so what I'm hoping you can do is kind of change your thinking when you see someone who is behaving in that way um, to think, wow, that's someone who is suffering with a severe disease. That is someone whose brain is really sick and I wanna get them into treatment rather than that's a terrible person. I don't wanna deal with them. They should stop doing these bad things because a lot of times what those behaviors are is really just a symptom of their underlying disease process. And to think this is someone that I really want to work on getting into treatment because we can kind of adjust those, adjust the trajectory of their life and really kind of mitigate some of those behaviors are symptoms, but not, um, not an underlying bad person. Does that make sense? Is that a lot of times we think of this as a moral disease rather than a brain disease. And I wanna stop here for questions. I apologize about this. I'm gonna have to stop it. Um, right now, no questions. Um, does this make sense to everybody and everyone feels like they have a good handle on all of the brain chemistry that we talk through? Because I feel like I went through a lot of receptors and you guys all have a master's degree in biochemistry at the end of this. Oh, actually, it looks like we have a question. Does the patient need to be breathing for Narcan to work or is it absorbed through the nasal mucosa? Fantastic question. So naloxone, so actually the nasal mucosa, so we see nosebleeds are very common because the nasal mucosa is highly vascular. So there's a ton of blood vessels running in the mucosa, mucosa of your nose. And mucous membranes are really wonderful at absorbing medication. So you do not need to be breathing. Um, the nasal passages are very efficient ways of delivering medications. Um, which actually you, you see a lot of folks use that as a route of administration for different substance use because it's such an efficient way to deliver medications to the brain. So no, person does not need to be breathing. Um, naloxone would work on, with someone who's under CPR. Um, so it's really a, a, a good efficient way to deliver medications. Excellent question. There are um, other forms of naloxone that are injectables. Um, but this one, the nasal spray, is the one that you can get for free from the naloxone distribution program from the state. And so this is, this is the easiest to use. And this is the one that I usually talk about and bring to give out to folks. Other questions? I feel like I went through really fast. That's all I see for now. Okay, so the other concept that I wanted to touch on is um, harm reduction, and that sometimes we will encounter people that we are not able to engage fully in treatments. And the principle of harm reduction is really this, is that we meet people where they are, but we don't leave them there. And so frequently you will encounter someone who is resistant to the concept of a substance use disorder and very resistant to the concept of treatment. 
And this is particularly true when you are dealing with adolescents and young adults because you have multiple stakeholders. So you need to engage not just the individual, but frequently their family, their caregivers, and those around them. So you will often encounter some resistance to um, engaging in treatment. Sometimes because, sometimes because of um, where they are and their beliefs in engaging in treatment. And so what we wanna do is not ever say that that is someone who should not be in treatment. We don't wanna walk away, but always continually offer them. And sometimes what you can say is like, okay, I understand that you're not ready for treatment now. How about I give you some naloxone? How about I refer you to, um, we can start small and say, will you just engage and talk to me next week? Um, to try and do those baby steps and to see where the individual and where the family will engage you um, so that you can kind of slowly move that conversation forward. What we also know is that this is a chronic illness and with any chronic illness, that cycle of relapse and recovery is part of the normal disease process. So you will see individuals who start to engage in treatment and then have a relapse of their disease process. That is not a failure. That is not a failure of treatment and that is not a failure of the individual. That is part of the normal trajectory of the disease and part of the road to recovery. There's a lot of times that um, relapse and recovery cycle that individuals will go through several cycles before they make it into a longer term recovery. And even an individual who has been in a long term recovery still can have those relapse and recovery cycles. And so the way we see that relapse period is not a failure. It's not a moral failing. It does not mean that treatment does not work, it does not mean that their previous treatment was a failure. It just is a normal trajectory of the disease process. And so really kind of taking this whole mindset of um, this is a regular medical disease, that there is treatment, that people can recover, that people do recover, and approaching it from that position. So that when you're engaging with someone and that someone has entered that relapse phase, that we also say to them, no problem, we just start again and that we bring you back into treatment. Um, and that that is an opportunity to re-engage someone potentially and further their treatment trajectory. Any questions about this concept? Because sometimes I think, particularly for adolescents, the first time you engage them is not gonna be the magic moment when they um, want to go into treatment. That frequently there is some part of, particularly adolescents of, of um, reluctance to engage in treatment because we have not fully engaged their frontal lobe, but not to consider that a barrier or a reason not to offer that lifeline. We do have a, another question. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk about dosages of Suboxone and how long treatment generally takes? Okay, yes. So the traditional dose of suboxone. Um, so adolescents, there's nothing different about brain chemistry for adolescents for young adults. And so we use similar doses across both. Um, the usual dose that people end up on is about 16 milligrams once a day. So, so frequently divided eight twice a day. But in my experience, the dose that works is the dose that that person should be on. We typically will see folks on higher doses to start and then slowly taper off to a place where that person feels functional but is no longer craving um, opioids. And so whatever dose works for that person is really the right dose. Remember that because it's a partial agonist that we don't see the same respiratory depression, it is a pretty safe medication. And so even at really high doses, people can be completely functional and will not have the euphoria sedation that you would see with a full agonist like methadone or morphine. And in terms of duration, remember we're thinking about this as a chronic illness. So some people 
do better on medications for many years. Some people will need to be on medications um, long-term. And that is okay. If that is what keeps that person functional and keeps their disease in recovery, that is what keeps their disease in recovery and we support that. They will have done studies on individuals and medication assisted treatments and people do best after at least two years of treatment. MRI studies of individuals who've been using, who have a substance use disorder, the brain shows brain chemistry changes associated with that exogenous dopamine that comes from the substance use. We do see after a year, the brain recovers. So the functional MRI studies of someone who's been in recovery for a year will look similar to someone who has never had a substance use disorder. And then after two years, the cognitive behavioral therapy has kicked in and frequently the, they will have developed other um, skills to replace the pathways that have driven them towards substance use. People who stop treatment shorter than two years have increased rates of relapse. So what I take from this is one, treatment should be individualized and whatever keeps that person functional is the right treatment and that no one should be rushed out of medication treatment. Um, that really, if something is working for someone that they should continue. Hopefully that answers your question. There is this feeling um, that goes back to stigma where we want, we say, well, you're just replacing one drug for another. And if you think about this as a disease process, I don't deny a diabetic insulin because that person needs insulin to survive. So if someone needs a medication to function, they need a medication to function. We're not just replacing one drug for another we're not then causing an addiction to buprenorphine. What we are doing is allowing the brain the space to recover and we are managing their chronic illness. Um, and so people should not feel that their recovery is not valid because they're using evidence-based treatment. Um, that all of the data shows that treatment with medicines work and that people are more likely to stay in recovery less likely to overdose if they're using medicines. So no one should be pushed out of medication quickly if that's working for them. And that's a message that I really want everyone to, um, to be able to reinforce, that if you see someone on medications, that's not a failure. That is someone who is doing the right thing and in treatment, and if it's working, they should stay. There's a follow-up to that. Um, mm -hmm. Does one titrate the dosage? Yeah, so frequently um, there's two ways, and this, this may be more than you guys want to know, but there's two ways to start buprenorphine. Um, frequently in a hospital and emergency department, they'll do what is called a quick start. So they will start buprenorphine and kind of give a high loading dose on the first day. There's also a low dose start where people are given slow doses of buprenorphine. Um, and kind of slowly titrated up to a dose that works for them and then stabilized on that dose. And then after that person has been stable, feels comfortable, they will slowly titrate down the dose. But there's a lot of like individualization of dosing. Buprenorphine, because it is that partial agonist, um, can cause withdrawal. So if someone is actively using and you give buprenorphine, remember it'll, it'll work like naloxone where it'll, it'll look at all those receptors. So if someone's used an opiate Oxycontin or heroin and has Oxycontin and heroin on those receptors in the brain, buprenorphine will come in and it'll kick everything else off because it really likes its receptor. So it'll get rid of all of the other opiates, kick it off the receptors, and then buprenorphine will, will sit on there. So in that setting, it acts a lot like um, naloxone. So sometimes someone will be given slow doses of buprenorphine to prevent that withdrawal. The alternate strategy is to give a loading dose of buprenorphine, which is to block all of the receptors 
and so that um, it will kick off all of the opiates, but block all of the receptors, and so that the brain will not feel the same withdrawal and cravings because all of the receptors will have been blocked. So there's two strategies for the start. Um, the usual dose that people end up on is about 16 milligrams a day, but really it does very individualized. That's probably more than you wanted. Any other questions? Um, how would you approach cultural reasons for not wanting to use medication assisted treatment? This is a great question. Um, and a lot of this has to do partially with people's individual cultural views, but more it, it comes down to how you view substance use disorders. Because no one would say that someone with asthma should not be given albuterol. No one would say that someone with diabetes should not be given insulin. So if we start to kind of walk through, and this is why we talked about that medical model, and we start to understand how substances impact brain chemistry, then we can start to understand why medications work. And so is this part of that harm reduction approach is if you have a family that says, no, we will not even consider medications, you say, okay, what will you consider? So you meet someone where they are, try to bring them slowly along that path. Um, but in no point do I say, if you're not going to do medications, I'm not even going to bother with you. You try and engage them wherever you are. Conversely, sometimes I will find someone who only wants medication and does not want to engage in any cognitive behavioral therapy, no contingency management, wants to do none of the counseling, that's okay too. Um, wherever that person is and however I can start to bring them into treatment, that's how I engage in that with that patient and that family. Um, but frequently, yes, there is a lot of stigma against substance use disorders there's a lot of stigma against treatment. Um, I think that there's a lot of stigma towards methadone and methadone clinics. And so we just kind of slowly have to all speak with one voice and understand like this is evidence-based treatment. Addiction is a disease and it is treatable and the outcomes are good. Fantastic question though, thank you. We have just a few minutes left. So um, any other questions about the Superman brain, my teenage brain? Anyone who's had um, strategies that, that work that they wanna bring up and talk about, happy to chat too. Okay, so this is, um, this is our program. This is the California Bridge Program. We have a lot of resources on our website about treatment, about the approach to substance use disorders, training around stigma. Um, our website is bridgetotreatment.org. You can reach out to anyone from our team at that, at that email address and certainly reach out to me. We are committed to expanding access to treatment and to decreasing stigma around substance use disorders for individuals. Me personally, I really feel like the lost decade is one of the things that I want to focus on and to do everything I can to increase knowledge about treatment options for adolescents and family members so that there, we, we don't lose a decade um, because we know that Adolescence is a critical period for addiction, but also a critical period in terms of being able to engage in some of the normal milestones of life and adulthood. And so the more that we can shorten that decade between starting use and treatment, the better. And so what I really am hopeful for is that what you walk away from is that understanding of addiction as a chronic illness that we have really actually wonderful treatments, particularly for opioids. We have some really wonderful treatments that work very well. And that, that really that this should be something that everyone is offered. There is no, there should be no shame or stigma in engaging in treatment. Um, 
because there are fantastic outcomes. And so those are things that I really hope that you walk away from that, that really we need to do a better job of screening and engaging, particularly adolescents and young adults. Um, and that I think part of the stigma is that we don't want to think that adolescents and young adults have a substance use disorder. We would much prefer to think that they are experimenting. But as we start to understand adolescent brain chemistry, we understand that even experimentation has a profound effect on their brain and that they're extremely high risk for developing a substance use disorder because of the stage of development of their brain. So leave you with that as well as my plug again for naloxone um, to participate in naloxone distribution programs and to really not be afraid of administering naloxone because it can save a life and that those lives that you would save with naloxone is very life-saving and that that is someone whose life we can save and then get into long-term treatment. Um, and so I'm happy to end here or entertain any last minute questions or comments. Thank you very much for your time and your attention. Um, one question, are, are there any things to consider in terms of accessing or administering naloxone during these COVID times? Um, so administering naloxone, because it's that nasal spray, so you would have to have someone without a mask to assess their breathing and to access their nose. It is not thought to be an aerosolizing generating procedure. However, if you are administering naloxone, you should continue to wear your mask um, because you would be in contact with someone who would be breathing. So you would be less than six feet from them. I know that there's um, a lot of fear of COVID, but frequently I come into contact less than six feet with my surgical mask on. And so we do feel like that would protect you from being that in that close contact. If you are wearing a mask, you would have to remove their mask if they were wearing one to administer the naloxone. But it's a great question. It looks like, um, let me take one last look. But yeah, it looks like um, there are no other questions. So we can um, conclude here. Thank you so much once again, Amy, for this very informative um, presentation. I know I learned a lot. And thank you everyone for joining us.